so hello everybody so i am going to talk about a uh, fruit tree pruning the one thing that i do want to clarify is i am going to go a little bit in how i approach it we are not talking about citrus pruning because citrus is something that we are not doing in winter they are frost tender so we usually have a class about or a webinar about uh, citrus pruning in a spring uh, where I will explain everything about citrus. So, and avocados, those are for that section. Um, so right now I am gonna start with uh, pruning the young trees. How Shannon says right now, there is a lot of fruit trees uh, at the stores. If you are getting your fruit trees, you are gonna have a bare root or you are gonna have potted. Um, some of the examples I have here is for uh, bare root trees. So meaning you just get that little stick with some roots and not soil. And usually what you're gonna do is you're gonna go and plant it. Um, so the idea is that you are kind of like studying your pruning. Um, this is um, the young, when you're pruning a young tree is really to develop your main scaffolds, your main structures, your main branches. You don't want them to be producing because the weight of the fruit is going to make those branches go down. So at the beginning, what I encourage people to do is let it flower. And as soon as you see the flowers dying, just remove the flowers. Don't let it produce the fruits. And uh, do that until the branches are uh, thick enough that they are not going to be bending down. And I'm going to show what I mean. So, but for right now, if you're gonna go to the store, um, you are gonna find bare root trees, which is like the two samples that I am showing in the screen. One is um, like a stick with no branches and one has really weak branches. So when you are buying your bare root uh, trees, you wanna look at the so you wanna look at the, at the uh, root, if they are fully like in a bag, try to see if you can see the roots, how many roots they have. If they don't have any roots, it will not grow really well. Um, you also want to look at uh, the, so most of the fruit trees do have uh, two different sections. And one is the bottom section um, that you can see in this picture here. One is uh, the scion, is the root section of the tree. And then the top section is the tree that you select and buy. So usually goes like a, a, a orange or an apple or an avocado, whatever it is. So you want to make sure that that uh, graft is above the ground and you are not going to uh, gonna do any like a strong pruning near that section. Water cannot be touching that section. Like if your irrigation is always hidden in there, uh, you don't want soil to hit that section. You don't want compost to be covered in that section. So especially at the um, younger age, those, um, those grafts are still uh, healing. So you want to make sure that uh, you are not getting too close to it, knowing the planting and knowing the pruning. So the first pruning that we talk is the winter pruning. Usually for young trees, I only do winter pruning. So that means it's one time a year, let the tree grow, do whatever they are going to do in growth. If they are, again, if they are producing a flower, a fruit, I will remove the fruit. Um, and I would suggest to, for you to do that. Um, and then um, we talk about a, br a pruning budget. The reason about the pruning budget is because sometimes or in the past, we used to cut trees really, really strong. And um, we need to figure it out. Like I figured it out that um, we, have now gardens where we want to be beautiful. We want our tree to be healthy. Right now we have a lot of uh, diseases that come around and trees are prone to certain diseases. And uh, we have realized that with pruning um, done right, you have um, a long lasting healthy tree. If the tree is cut really strong, the tree will grow, but it will have wounds that maybe they are not able to heal or that the diseases will go through. So doing the right pruning and uh, letting the tree grow and develop is actually pretty important. So the pruning budget 
is going to help you to realize when to prune hard and how much is hard. And maybe it will not make sense right now, but maybe with the drawings I did, it will. But that is one of the things that I want you guys to keep in mind when you are going to go and do your pruning. Okay, it's winter pruning. You can have a budget about 10% to 80%. So in this case, with young trees, we go towards the 80%, meaning we're cutting, we can be cutting 70, 60, or you know, 50% of our tree. So in this case, when I am doing the uh, fr a fruit tree pruning for um, new trees that, add, um, that are bare root, like in this example, these two examples, I am gonna go plant them, uh, make sure that my graft is above the ground. Um, the soil level is this line here, the brown line I put. Um, and uh, and then as soon as I planted, I'm gonna cut right, like it can be like before it was 18, 12 inches above the graft line. Um, so, and that is like a simple, uh, rule of thumb. I use that when I have trees, like in the, this first one that doesn't have any any branches. So that will be a good way to stimulate the tree to start producing branches. The one thing about fruit trees is a re they are really strong trees. So if as soon as they get settled down, um, they are going to be growing a lot and growing really strong. And that's what we want out of our trees. Um, so the the 12 inches as a rule of thumb comes from you know you don't have any branches however if you know what you want out of your tree so then you can figure it out what um when to cut and how to cut so in this case we look at the role of the tree so if i have a little apple tree that i want them to be five feet tall so maybe the 12 inches works perfectly because my branches are going to be 12 inches above the ground. So I am not going to be able to go with my mower under the tree. It's really small. My branches are there. The branches, where they start, they stay. They don't grow up. So you have to be aware of that. So the other one will be like a normal tree that you want to be able to put some seeding under. So in that case, you want you don't want to do that cut so low. You want to let the tree develop and um, and develop some branches and start from above. Um, so there are certain rules again, like cutting above uh, the twelve inches is one of the rules. The other rules is like the different systems, training systems that you can have. So usually that helps you or uh, people to understand a little bit what uh, what to do with your tree when um, and how to develop it. So the central leader is when you have like one single trunk and then you have your branches and your scaffolds. Usually the central leader is used for trees that you are gonna go and grow uh, kind of like tall. It can be 10, 15 feet tall. So pretty much those are the ones that you go under and mow with the mow and you're walking under uh, standing up. Um, those are usually for like persimmons. Usually you have apples, uh, pears. Um, some of those trees are perfect for that. Then we have the open center. I put here one uh, open center system. Uh, you can do a delay open center and an open center. So the open center pretty much is you have a little trunk uh, and then you have, um, you cut that central leader and you develop your structure and it becomes kind of like a multi-trunk type. Um, those are really good for apricots and cherries and uh, peaches, all these trees that are actually, um, they grow really strong and they produce the fruit in the last year growth. So um, the delay open center is how tr how high your trunk is, pretty much where your main scaffolds start. So, and you can go as high as possible or as low as possible. Uh, remember that if, again, those branches, whatever those main branches are, is where your main scaffolds are gonna be. So if you wanna reach uh, easily, your plant, your main scaffolds should be lower. 
And then the other one that is really simple, um, it's also really common, is the espalier. And we have now like a lot of plants that we can actually buy in the espalier style. Like you can even, even get uh, blueberries. I am doing my blueberries espalier because I have this little deck with so many things. So I have oranges um, and I have, uh, yeah, blueberries. Um, so you can do apples, pears. The one thing that I feel that espalier is really doesn't work that well will be the lemons just because you're going to be cutting so much that people end up growing a green plant and not really seeing much of a lemon in there because they have to grow to produce the fruit and you are cutting so much. So those are the only ones that I would say don't use as a espalier. Um, so then, um, so when you have your trees, one of the things that you want to do is like this is the other case about having a little bit of a bare root or not bare root, but it's a plant that just look like little sticks. So in that case, that is the same thing. You are going to do, you're going to plant it. Um, and then you. one of the things that you're going to do is select uh, your scaffolds. And in that case, you can select, um, you. one of the things is when uh, you buy the tree, you want to try to make sure that your scaffolds are not growing all from in the same point. Because sometimes branch break. Even though you do a really good job, it's windy, something, and a branch break. What is going to happen is if all the branches are growing at the same point, look close to it, so then you have an open wound and everything, your main tree is already um, compromised. So the important thing is that you realize, and I put here six inches is the minimum that you want to have distance between your branches uh, in the vertical space. So from the lower section to the lower section, you want to have six inches. And even though they are going around in a circle, like they are not growing one above the other one, they are kind of like going uh, in different directions. You still want those six inches, just in case that you have a problem with that connection between the branch and the bark and the trunk. Um, if, for example, it breaks a little bit and becomes a weak point, you want to be able to cut it and not compromise the rest of the branches. Um, also, that gives you a good spacing in between the branches. The other thing that you want to do is, that, for example, in this case, I am showing another example where you are cutting 80% of your tree. So when you have something like that, let's talk about, like, for example, having an apricot. So in that case, I am going to use an open center. And um, and this this following uh, drawing here uh, with the little purple marks and green marks is where I did my cuts. So you can see like a, like a shadow or what it was and what it is, the before and after. Um, and that will be a really strong pruning. Um, what is going to happen is this tree is going to develop a really strong structure after that. Like it's going to grow double the size. And that is the type of stimuli that we do in fruit trees um, throughout most of their years. And we want to make sure that uh, the younger they are, we cut kind of like a strong. And then the older that they get, the less strong that we cut. So our budget will change a little bit. The one thing that I want to show here uh, in this picture, for example, is giving you, um, these are the type of uh, branches that I was mentioning, that when you let them uh, in the lower section, you have these branches that are kind of like growing up, but growing really skinny. All those branches are things that I will cut in my, in my first pruning. Let's say that this is planted, it has been planted for two years in the ground, um, and somebody called me. And so all these branches below, so let's start again. These branches that have the red arrows uh, pointing at them, those are going to be my main scaffolds. So why those are going to be my main scaffolds? Because they have the perfect angles. They are going, they are going, they are going 45 degree angles. I want those angles and I want those angles to stay. And even though those, those uh, branches are, um, 
is strong enough to maybe take one or two fruits. I don't let them fruit because it's going to bend down. So the branches below look like one of them, they were, it was going up and they let it fruited and it bent down. So that means I'm going to remove that branch. I want all my branches in a young tree to be 45 degree angles and open. And that, that the reason for that is that um, if you look at the long term of your tree, the more weight that you put in that branch, the lower that the branch is going to get. So starting your tree with a 45 degree angle branches is the best you can do for your tree. Uh, in this case, these lower branches, uh, you can say, well, you know, for now, let's say that this is an apple. If this is an apple, what I will do is I will cut that that uh, center um, center part and will leave those two branches. And uh, I will reduce these uh, little branches uh, to two to three buds to start having my fruit really close, close to... Um, close to the trunk. So like that, there is not much weight affecting my tree. Um, the other reason why we don't let fruit, young fruit trees produce is because the weight of the fruit may, may make the tree lean. And then you will have issues with broken roots and not stability in the whole tree. So in this case, um, I am showing what I mean with the scaffolds. So what I mean is the the letters, the uh, branches that had the numbers one, two, three, four are uh, the scaffolds that I am gonna keep and the scaffolds that I feel they had really good angles. And those are the scaffolds I want. Uh, you can see also that not, not all the scaffolds are right at the same point, growing at the same point. I have little distance between them and they are going all the way around, but that those are the scaffolds I am gonna keep. So um, no, not to say that the rest of the things are all are gonna go, but what I wanna show with this picture is the great angles that these scaffolds have. And that is why those are gonna be my main scaffolds that I'm gonna kind of like keep going on and uh, put, uh, developing. And if there is any weight, I'm gonna try to hold them um, hold the branch uh, high up so it will not bend down. Remember, branches that are going up uh, are stronger than branches that are going down. So when the branches are going down, the growth of the branch change. So we don't want that. In this picture also, I wanna show a little bit of what I'm. Uh, we have here that is like spurs. So this is an apple and we have here few spurs growing already in this tree. So that means this branch, these branches over here must be three years old. So I um, the spurs uh, is part of um, a lot of the fruit trees that we see around the area. So these are the uh, fruit trees that grow spurs. The spurs are different in different trees. Some of them last for a long time. So apples and pears have the spurs that last the longest, can be up to eight years. However, you don't want really eight year old spurs in your tree just because it will, it's gonna produce really little fruit. Um, you wanna be renovating your spurs and that's why you wanna be pruning and maintaining your tree no matter how old it is. Uh, but in any case, you have a spurs, um, so in the, uh, in the long lasting spurs, you have the apples and the pears and the cherries, um, they produce up to three years so four. And the Japanese plum also is kind of like three years. Um, this is the Japanese plum, not the, um, the other plum. Uh, the, I forget the name of the plum, um, the one that we see around here. Um, so then we have the flower, uh, so they are fl they, the, in the other one, you have flower buds that people call spurs, but they are not really spurs. So they will produce in the last year growth. So we have apricots and um, plums will produce buds. So those are the trees that you usually kind of like, um, they, the, people used to cut really hard because they want it to grow really strong. Right now we realize that we don't need to cut them that hard. But having that spurs is important. So going back to going back to this tree, so this tree has 
uh, already a sperm growing on it. So if in the case of having this reproducing, this sperm is really close to the trunk. So you can, if you are gonna leave some of the uh, 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 sperm produced, those spurs close to the trunks are good. So now in this case, if I am gonna have these branches over here in the picture um, being developed as spurs, what I will do is the treatment of how to develop these spurs. So usually, let's say for apples and pears, you are gonna, uh, that little branch you are gonna cut. You are gonna cut to leaving two to three bats. Those little rounded points is me drawing the bats. So you can cut uh, and leave two, two bats or something. So those two bats next year in the spring, they are gonna develop and you can cut them again. As soon as this green uh, section becomes to be three years old, it's gonna produce the uh, spurs and it's most probably gonna look like these branches over here. Not super thick, but like a finger thick or something like that. So those are gonna be how you produce uh, spurs. And um, with branches like this one in this uh, picture, those are the perfect ones that I say to my client, okay, you give up in growth and fruit in the main scaffolds, and I still give you some areas where you have few fruit. Um, and like that, I can balance that. Um, so now for mature trees, um, there is a, a, diff, a little bit of a different approach. The first thing is you want to have, uh, you have different goals. Um, your first thing is your budget. Your pruning budget is going to be different. You're going to have a 25 to 30% budget. So you are cutting a quarter of the tree, no more than that. And why I say that? Because a lot of the times when you cut more than that, like if you cut 50% of the tree or something, a lot of the times if the tree, um, the tree can get stressed and not produce any fruit because it, it goes into chalk. Um, and also, like for let's say that there's apples and pears, so pretty much you may end up cutting a lot of that spurs that was producing because the remember the the the, the wood itself needs to be three years old. So a lot of the times when people is oh my trees are not producing, I always ask when was the last pruning, how much they cut, um, and stuff like that. So. Um, the goals of the pruning itself is, yes, we're going to control the size. We want to be able to reach the tree. We don't want the tree to be super uh, high. Um, control the size is something that we want to do, like in the Bay Area, usually. Uh, we want uh, One of the things that we, as the people that is pruning, wants to keep in mind is that we want that sunlight and air move circulation in the tree. So we always, I always thin out my trees and try to like uh, remove a lot of uh, stuff that is making the tree uh, look really crowded. Uh, the branch strength is something that I work on in the fruit trees and people see me pulling the branch to see if it's gonna bend uh, over uh, too much with the weight. And then if it's bending too much, I will reduce the branch, not necessarily cut it, cut it but reduce in length. And that is gonna give you uh, and well, it's going to give the tree that uh, because they grow lengthwise, so long, but they also grow in ledgers, so they get thicker. So by you reducing that branch, if that branch is in a good place and you reduce it a little bit, um, it, it makes that branch still grow, but um, generate some thickness for it to get stronger and develop that strength to hold the fruit. So um, one of the things I say a lot is also balancing uh, balancing the growth of the bigger in the tree. And that is kind of like what I say, that is my game because we wanted to, we need to understand that the trees had kind of like, they have that apical dominance. The apical dominance is that they are stronger in the upper section and in the outer section and the weaker, um, or less strong section is the lower branches and the inside. So we, as the pruners, need to balance that. And so when I go and do my trees, I don't cut too, a lot of the times when I see 
people coming and working with me, I see they start really hard at the bottom section uh, because it's easy, you know, it's there right there. You can actually do something, you know how to climb the tree or the ladder, but it's backwards. You do want to start from the upper section and controlling the length, um, the height, and then if you still have some of the budget, if you have not cut enough, so then you work in your lower sections um, because that is what you want to hit the tree. You want to say, okay, you you want to tell the tree, okay, you need to go slow in the upper, you need to like open up the tops. So when it comes to growing, you are kind of like giving advantage to the lower section to have some light um, and develop uh, some air circulation. And then uh, you want to generate new wood. So I actually was, I put it this one just uh, today because I was in my client yesterday and she told me my fruit was really small this year. And I was kind of like, oh, I was expecting that. I started in this house two years ago. And um, and the first year we didn't do the pruning because the trees were sick and I arrived like late in the season. So uh, so I started last year uh, with the pruning and I did a uh, few and I told her, let them be bushy. We are not gonna do summer pruning we're, we're going to let them bush, uh, get bushy in the upper section. And it was because I see that the tree um, has been pruned strong, too strong for the tree because it's not having a lot of growth. It's just kind of like stunted. So, so then she told me, yeah, I prune my tree right after harvesting, kind of like around fall. I come and do the pruning right away and I harvest everything. And I, that is when I do my pruning. And that is why the tree is kind of like stunted and not growing so much. So um, the so we need to, one of the things that I try to do a lot is with that winter pruning, is we generate a lot of new growth. And that, that new growth is really good because you are gonna use that new growth in certain sections to produce your spurs and produce your fruit. So the new growth is really important. She doesn't have any of that. so. This year, I had to cut really hard the trees, even though they had a nice shape and have a nice structure, because I want that tree to stimulate the tree. So, um, and then now we go with the, in the pruning goals, this is not a goal, but I do have to put it there. Remember that if you're having, you're cutting 30% of your tree. And it, we're talking about plums, we're talking about apricots, we're talking about apples, we're talking about persimmons, we're talking about everything. Um, and the reason why that 30%, again, is to balance how strong they are gonna react and that they can still produce fruit, but they are not gonna be overwhelmingly tall so you cannot get the fruit. Uh, so, but usually I do have to control my trees. So I do two prunings. One is the winter pruning and the other one is summer pruning. If I have a tree that is growing too much and my plant, my, my client is like, it's touching my house or it's overwhelming, I prune two times. So this is how I do my pruning, when to prune and what, what tree. So winter pruning, I do apple, pears, persimmons, pluats, figs, pomegranates, cherries, plums, um, all the plums, like the Japanese and the one that I'm forgetting, and the apricots. So the ones that had the asterisk are the ones that get kind of sick around this area. So the pears get fire blight, the peaches and cherries and plums and apricots, they have that gomosis going, uh, and dragnos or um, stuff like that. So. If I have, so we have to be aware of that. So pruning, remember that pruning is an open wound. An open wound with diseases will go through. So I try to make, I say when people say, what is the important thing about pruning? Right now I'm saying time it right. Because if you time it right, you still have the fruit, you still have the control and you have less diseases. So. So my first one will be in winter. And when is winter? Winter starts from, from December. As soon as they lose the leaves, December all the way to February and sometimes like March for like San Francisco area. I would say you can still do March. Uh, 
So then I have my second pruning. And in the second pruning, pruning, um, I can do like uh, the in the early summer, I can do the apples and the pears. Usually, if I have a mature tree, I do apples and pears pruning just to remove some of that uh, foliage that is making the tree really shaded in the inside and the fruit is not going to grow uh, uh, thick. I put here um, as a second pruning, but it is actually the first pruning olive trees. People always ask me about olive trees. I do olive trees like early spring, uh, late spring, early summer, um, because you have to time it. So olives, you I used to say you can do olives every uh, any time, but again, a disease is going around and is being pretty prolific, and it has started like from like maybe five, six years ago, I keep seeing the disease going around, is the peacock uh, leaf uh, something, I forgot, sorry. Um, but anyway, it's a disease. So usually now when I get a client with olives, I say, okay, as soon as the rain starts, it stops, I can do your olives and I can do your olives anytime between the dry season. If you want your fruit, um, so then I have to time it earlier or after the fruit, um, but I don't do it in the rainy season. So for the trees that I am doing in winter, if he has an asterisk, that means the ones that had some sort of problem. If you see gum, the yellow kind of like honey looking stuck, a uh, thin stuck in the branches. So you do have a little bit of a disease going on. If your purse had that die back, so then I have to adjust and I do not for any reason cut in the winter. Um, so what I do is I cut right after harvesting the fruit, which it can be, you know, like early as a summer or it can be a little bit late summer. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, like, and I do my winter pruning and my everything pruning at that time. Um, so it gives the tree the time to is, uh, develop and grow and produce the fruit for next year. So the, the fruits that I do right after harvesting is the pears, the pluas, the peaches, the cherries, the plums, and the apricots. And I don't do the two prunings. I do or in winter if they are healthy or after harvesting if they have any diseases. And I do have mark in my calendar and they do work if you do that and only that pruning a year after harvesting, the tree will grow. It's a little bit uh, more difficult because you have um, you have to pick up the fruit, clean up the mess, and you have all the foliage. So it's not so easy to see, but the trees will still fruit and you will not have problems with uh, the disease. Uh, getting bigger or spreading the disease around. Um, if you have any disease like uh, in your plants, I would suggest to clean your tools when you are going from tree to tree. I do it. I clean with alcohol or Lysol. I spray, I wash it, I clean. I don't want to see any sap in my, in my tools at all. And I uh, clean with alcohol. Uh, if it's about a bacterial disease that, um, that some of the trees have. Um, so the pruning steps, uh, so when I'm a mature tree, these are the pruning I do. The first thing I do is hey, I cut the dead. Yeah. Elizabeth, I'm sorry. Don't, I, I apologize for stepping in. There's a question I wanted to put out to you real quick before you move on from kind of your list of things. There are some things that are not on your list, like some of the, um, like the loquat family and and you did talk about figs. I was thinking that do loquats kind of fall under the, like the apricot umbrella? Do they act like a stone fruit or are they kind of their own, are they their own category? I, in my head, I always think, well, kumquat and loquat, but they're not at all the same thing. So I wanted to make sure that I wasn't giving bad information on loquats. Loquats. Uh, loquats are, yeah, so loquats you actually want to do, uh, a, I try to do pruning right after the uh, fruit. Right. Um, so after the harvesting, and the only reason for that is because um, 
they if you cut too late into the season or if you cut right now in winter you are not going to have fruit for next year so um you do so usually for the loquats what i do is right after the flowers are done i cut so it's usually like uh late spring okay early summer something like okay. that Okay, perfect. And then one more question before I let you get back to it. Sorry. Um, you were talking about mature trees and how to prune for mature, um, for mature branches and for like the leader, I guess I had one question about persimmons asking about cutting down, um, a leader branch that's, you know, 20 plus years old, something that's really mature. Like what is the best way to take care of? And what I didn't ask um our viewer is you know is there a reason that they're trying to cut down that tree but what is or the, that that actual branch that leader branch so like what is the best way to go about trimming that down if it needed to happen okay uh yeah so for example in here i have to uh the thinning and the cutting of the branches that is something that is going to help usually when i am cutting uh, some branches, even though this is a small drawing, uh, is the same principle. You always wanted to find, there are two ways to cut a branch. Uh, one, you're gonna cut it. So for example, in this first drawing over here, right. uh, you, you can cut the branch all the way to the point of growth. So I'm removing all this branch. Uh, you can do that, oh, sorry, is this one over here? Um, I apologize. In the bottom section, thinning a branch, so in this case, you want, I, I remove all the branch um, and I am removing to the point of growth. The other one, uh, the upper section is mm -hmm. cutting a branch to a branch left. So you are gonna find another branch that is thick enough or uh, that you can take that, uh, can take the strength from what you are removing and grow from it. So um, let me see if I have, um, I think I saved some of the other. Um, so if it's a big, big branch that you have to remove all the weight from the trunk. So what you want to do is you do a jump cut. So you cut one, the first cut is the bottom cut. The second cut is the top cut. It will break and then you do the third cut that is cleaning cleaning the cut so it's just one cut to to uh right above the collar so in this section over here you say branch collar branch collar is really visible in big branches especially like in persimmon you will see it it's a, this bulkiness um right um in uh in a in the connection between the branch right. and the bark uh you want to cut right above that collar um so that is one way to cut a big branch. Um, the other thing, so for example, I have here the prune here. So in this one, you can see the color. I kind of like brown it up a little bit. You can see how the bulkiness goes. You don't want to do a flash cut um, and you want to just prune right above the color. Um, I know you're going to get to this. I apologize for making you jump ahead at all. Sorry about that, because I really want to be able to go into that when we get to it, because, um, you know, as as employees, we want to be able to give the right advice. And that 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 point that you just made is a big one. So I will try to stop bothering you until we get to that point. But that's a good piece of information based on cutting back, you know, leader branches if and when you need to. Um, one quick other thing, and then I'll let you get back to it. Um, just for everybody watching, we are going to this this today Saturday. This webinar will be posted on our website and on our YouTube page as of Tuesday. Um, Elizabeth does not send out her PowerPoint presentation, but I have learned that once it gets posted, I can go in and do screenshots of things that I really want to hang on to, um, just so that you have it. You know, as you're going back later in the year, or as you're doing your actual pruning, just so that you have that information there and available. So 
Don't feel like you have to have the presentation emailed to you or that you have to be writing everything down. This, this whole webinar will be posted on our website and again on our YouTube page. And then you can go slowly through it. You can take pictures of, of screens if you need to. You can you know take better notes if, if necessary. And I'll make sure that everybody has our email if you have questions and Elizabeth's email. She's you know, wonderful enough to give out her, her email to be able to answer questions for you guys. So that is all forthcoming. Okay, sorry, Elizabeth, take it away. Oh, no, so, so on the other thing about cutting a branch, so if you are not removing your branch all the way from uh, the point of growth, um, so then find a branch lead. So this is the example in this upper section in how you can reduce the branch. And it doesn't matter how tall it is, or how thick it is, it's the same principle. Find a branch. So I, I always say cut to something. So if you are cutting to something, that will help uh, for the tree to grow from there. Um, the one about the notes is, so if you just cut on top of your tree or just cut with nothing. So in this case, you have example of how you can cut and not have anything else. What you're gonna get is this reaction and uh, having a lot of shoots coming from there. And what happens is those shoots are gonna have a really bad attachment. So when you are gonna cut a branch, I want you to cut a branch that, um, if you are not cutting it all the way from the point of growth, you wanna have a good transition. So meaning the, the branch that you are cutting, it has, or a branch that can support that cut, like thick enough, or that you have many branches around that cut. And what it does is it helps that energy that was going to that branch, uh, it stimulates growth all the way around. It still it stimulates growth in that point, but also all the way around. So if you are reducing your branch, find a secondary branch, cut to something, cut to something that is alive and cut to something that has strength. And at the same time, in that point, you are also sending a directionality. You are choosing which direction you want that branch to go. So if I cut in this example, what is my, if I, if this example, I go and cut to the one that is going up, I'm telling the, the branch to go up, the new growth. If I go to the one that is going to the left, the, the branch that, that is gonna develop stronger is the one that is right up next to the cut. So I am giving directionality to my tree. So um, so going back to the, the first step that I want you to do is cut your, uh, well, the first step I would say is have your goals. You know, like this person that asked the question, he already know that he needs to cut that. That is a good goal. Why he's cutting it? Maybe it's too big, maybe it broke, maybe it's out of the way. Um, so in that case, having a clear why this needs to go. So it is really important uh, because it's gonna tell you how far do you need to go. Maybe, you know, cutting it halfway. It does, if it's because it's in the way, you know, if you cut something really strong, you're gonna get a strong reaction. So if this branch is in the way, let's say that is, you know, you always have to bend down to go under the branch. If you go and do a really strong cut, meaning you're gonna cut half of the branch, you're gonna have a lot of growth in that branch and it's gonna become a bigger branch, thicker with more branches. So maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you wanna reduce it all the way, uh, cut it all the way to the point of growth. Um, the other thing that I do have to say about that is um, the, the jump cut that I mentioned, the three cuts before, the two cuts before the last one. The other thing that you can do is if you have to cut something that has a lot of weight, start removing the weight out of that branch. And then when you are close, you can do your final cut. Big branches, uh, it's important that you do clean cuts uh, because that uh, meaning you have to do, it's not like chopping around and cutting to the other side. You want to have a clear cut uh, because that helps and keep the collar because the collar is the one that helps that wound callus. So if uh, pretty much grow over. So it's pretty important that you do good cuts. So again, uh, you're going to find the same thing with cutting the trade this. So you are going to have 
uh, clean, you're gonna have to have clean cuts. You may have to remove, if it's dead, remove it all the way to the, where you see living tissue. Um, the disease, you wanna cut anything that is diseased. You also wanna go to cut it right above the collar or cut into another branch and that is not disease. Um, and the same thing if it's broken. Oh, it's broken, but it's still alive. It's a point of entry for diseases. You must remove it, especially with fruit trees because the broken branches or the damaged branches will not hold your fruit. So cut the disease and damage and look at it and tell, look at the tree and see if it's, if it's already your 30%. If it's already your 30%, you stop there and now you realize you do have a little bit of an issue in health because uh, that is a lot of debt. Um, that is why I always put it there. And uh, Maybe you want to stop and then do a little bit of the pruning later on uh, in the year. That will be better for the tree that do a really strong pruning now. Uh, so then... The next step after you cut your dead disease at much, let's say that you cut it and it wasn't that much. Uh, it was three, four branches out of your whole tree. Fine. So then what you're going to do, what I usually do is I generate that imaginary line. That imaginary line kind of tells me, makes me realize what everything is. So I start identifying my scaffolds and where they are and how they develop. So the, I, I draw that in that orangey way. So the orangey things versus the, the, the shadow looking branches is that the orangey ones are my scaffolds, my main structure. So I wanna make sure that I look at those and anything else is an extra. So if you focus in your main scaffolds, you are solving your problems. So that's what winter pruning is all about, working in your main scaffolds. If you do three cuts and you remove your 35, that is enough for right now. That is good enough. So um, in this case, I am gonna look at my main scaffolds. I see that I have few problems. So what you are gonna look when you're looking at your main scaffolds is how they develop. So I start going from bottom to down, and I see, for example, there are some crossing. So you don't want branches crossing in each other and touching and making wounds. You have to solve that. Uh, again, because open wounds are open uh, areas for disease to come in. You don't want to have competition. So that means if you have two branches growing pretty close together, so then one is going to shade the other one. So right away, you're going to solve that problem. Um, and then, so that is when I said, okay, usually I ask my client if it's new, what is the ultimate height in this tree? And like that, I know how much do I have to go down for the tree uh, in my pruning, with the pruning, for the tree to go to that height. If they say to me, hey, you, I want that tree to be half, half uh, size, it's too big. I say, okay, I will get there, but it may take me three years. I am not gonna do that in one year. I will do it in three years. It's gonna be half size in three years. So that is really important. And the 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 strong looking at my scaffolds is gonna tell me, can I promise that or not? So I had a client that she let the tree grow really, really tall. So main scaffolds, I have to use a ladder to, to touch the first main scaffolds. Uh, my ladder is eight foot tall. So in that case, if she say, can you make this tree five feet tall? And I'm gonna, I, I do have to say no, that is not an expectation I can uh, commit to. Uh, your tree is already, your main scaffolds are way so high. No matter if I cut them right now, uh, they are gonna produce growth, but they are not gonna produce a, a strong enough growth for me to have a five feet tall tree. So, um, so in this case, I am identifying what are the problems. So this is the first thing um, that you want to identify in your tree. Uh, what is the problem? So this person already know this branch. In this case, I have a problem here. The, the purple uh, things tells me, okay, there is crossing here. There is another crossing over here. And there is a crossing over there. So instead of me trying to cut here and cut here and opening up, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow where this crossing goes and select which branch I want to keep. So I identify my, my problems, but I look for the good. So I am looking at which branch I'm going to keep because that is more important than which branch I'm going to cut. The branch I'm going to keep, I'm going to see, okay, why I'm looking for that? Because I select this one. So then I am having an upper branch going up but I have a really nice one with 45 degree angle here. So that is the branch I wanna keep. So the same thing here, I have a branch that is really strong um, and then I have my 45 degree angle. So in this case, I'm gonna do a really strong cut. I have one, so the red he thing here on the other drawing is the three cuts I make um, to solve the problems in this branch going forward, this crossing here and this crossing here. And you can already see how much cutting these th two branches here, how much the tree open up. They were main scaffolds. Um, and the, when you cut a main branch like that, you remove a lot of things, a lot of them. So um, a lot of branches are attached to that. So, but I solve a lot of the problems. So like all that main um, congestion there is solved by removing that branch. So then I have, then I use the same principles on how I remove and thin out. I do it around until I find the right, um, until I get to my, uh, my goal in height. One of the things I do when I'm selecting that height is also I'm looking if that height I'm selecting, I can do it all the way around the tree. Because I want, again, my game is balancing the bigot of the tree. So if you realize I did cut in the lower sections, I didn't cut only at the top. At the top, I cut at the end. I have really low cuts coming at the bottom. But, but, and they are were really big cuts. Those cuts are gonna generate a strong growth, a strong growth that I'm gonna start in the next pruning. I'm gonna try to control um, if I don't want it or if I wanna develop uh, lower branches to generate uh, a fruiting uh, wood. Um, so with this, I already cut some of the main scaffolds and everything that I have to do at the top is go around and reduce it. And those are the three uh, drawings in how I reduce the tops, you know, like reduce, cut to an, a secondary branchlet, cut to a secondary branchlet. It doesn't matter or cut to, or cut uh, all the way to the point of growth. So it doesn't matter how uh, strong um, or how thick your branch is. The principles are the same when you are doing your main scaffolds and, and if you are doing, you know, little details here. You wanna do good cuts, you wanna cut with an angle. So you see that cut over here in this drawing um, is, is a cut that you, you wanna go right with the angle of the branch that you are leaving. So like that, this, the wound can callus and the branch is gonna develop uh, a strong. Um, I already talked about the don'ts. Um, and in this case, you have the before and after. So you can see that in this case, I did cut like a good 35% of the tree. But if you can see it's all, the tree still looks like a tree. It's just smaller and more open. And that was when people say, oh, do your magic. It's not magic. I'm looking at my structure. And my structure is going to tell me how to cut. And that's why sometimes it's scary. And if you are not used to, so then uh, you can go with making just one of the cuts. And if you see how that develop, so then you can go and do the other cut. But it is really important that you have that before and after. And in the before and after, you can, like, you can learn a little bit about budget. And if you see the three, like in general, what did I do? I decongest the center and I decongest the top. So that is my balancing act. My balancing act was, remember that the tree is stronger at the top and at the outer sections. What did I do? I cut the top and the outer sections and I open up the inside. So I'm letting light and wind go through. Um, so Q&A. 
Jenna? Perfect. Here I am. Sorry. Trying to get my video together. Um, I do have one question that's kind of lingering, although I think that you're going to talk about it. Um, if you if you're looking at uh, Elizabeth's outline, she talks about how she's going through all of the pruning and all of those specifics first, and then now she's going to talk a little bit about pr uh, products and then things that are um, you know like issues that could happen, any you know things like that. And so the question that I have that's sitting in front of me is really about sap and um, you know if that's an indication necessarily of a sick tree. And I feel like you're getting to that, so I was hoping to not have to bother you until you get into that point. But we do have a couple of questions based on, you know, like breakage or um, things that look like they could be health issues for the tree and how to determine that and whether all the timing of things, when to prune, how to prune, if that is across the board, even if there's something, you know, that's that is obviously not healthy about the tree. So I have a feeling that as you move forward, you're gonna kind of get into that. So I, I think that everything else has been mostly spoken about. The one thing you haven't really gone into, is there a difference between like nut trees? Should we change anything up about the advice? And I know when Elizabeth listed all the trees that we're talking about that kind of fall under that fruit, you can't list everything. So like I had to ask about the loquats. Now I'm asking about almonds. A lot of this stuff is transferable, knowing that she can't list every last you know possibility. But um, anything different about nut trees that stands out to you? Um, no, nut trees. Um, so, the, uh, okay, like nut trees, I actually different in between them. Um, but I will say you can do the winter pruning. So pretty much look at it this way. Deciduous trees, good to do winter pruning unless that they are sick. So um, evergreen trees, um, good to do um, a pruning according with the flowers and the fruit. Right. So you don't want for the for the uh, evergreens you don't want to cut them anytime because you want to make sure that you are not cutting the flowers uh, and the, uh, them the fruit uh, so usually that's why i say cut right after the harvest you do your your pruning with evergreens if it's deciduous usually you do winter pruning yes okay perfect um all right, good. Well, then I'm going to let you get back to it because we're we're already kind of over our 11 o'clock and that's fine. But I want to give you time to be able to just talk a little bit about products and about some just kind of disease stuff and things to look for and look at in that regard. Okay. So for the products, um, I have here the things I use. They are not the only ones. Um, they are the things that have worked for me. For the products, I do have to say that it's more like my thing about I try and this world so i am not like a expert about it it's just things that have worked for me and i realized i had uh yeah that they have worked for me so i do have to say that i don't work with uh fertilizers that are um that are artificial so i try to do organic fertilizers um things that had like a a primary and secondary nutrients that have uh, also a other like humic acid, soil microbes, mycorrhizae, all this stuff is really helpful for the soil. Like one person told me, asked me one time, like, what is the import most important thing about what I, what can I give to the fruit trees that is the ultimate thing? And I say a good fertilizer. If you have nice soil, if you have good soil, if you put, you don't want to put fertilizer and you have a lot of compost added, that's even better. So I will say um, having a, a good soil, working in your soil, um, putting in things that help the plants, like mycorrhizae healthy plants, the fungi healthy plants getting water, transmit water from sections all the way to the root system helps nutrients to get in the right um, composition that plants can take it. I mean, we do have clay soil. Clay soil is not a bad soil in the sense that it has a lot of nutrients. We just need to help the plant get in those nutrients. And having microbes and having 
Mycorrhizae is something that helps. So those are the fertilizers that I put here that I know it has those those elements, all of them or some of them. And I try to do uh, this, uh, use these fertilizers. Um, talking about fertilizers, the other thing that I do try to be really aware is, you know, when to put the fertilizer and how much fertilizer to put. I had learned recently, believe it or not, that is actually more helpful for your trees to put fertilizer more often and little than a bunch of fertilizer and let go. Um, and I always wonder why these bags of fertilizer say, put one cup a month. And I was like, oh, they just wanna sell fertilizer. And so I did my try and error. I had one section of my, my garden where I start putting just fertilizer every month a little bit. And I when I water and I would put it and I would put it in, it was just a little bit, a little bit. And the difference has been amazing. For the plants I put a lot of fertilizer and let them be for the year. And for the plants I put little fertilizer every month or every other month, according with you know, like the, the size of the plant. I will say the like putting more often little bits uh, that a lot at once is way better. Um, so it helps the plants in the long run better to have, like even if it's a slow release because I only use a slow release fertilizer. Um, I don't use a specific like fruit tree fertilizer for the fruit trees. I know people always say like, why you just don't do that one? I think that, you know, like I use that, the first one for like the happy frog for vegetables. Um, I use it like throughout the year for most of my fruit trees when I see a fruit tree is not growing strong because that has lots of uh, micronutrients. Um, and so I am kind of like feeding it throughout the year. I do the acid loving plants, for example, for things like, low quads, citrus, um, I do um, a little bit um, in um, um, pomegranates. Uh, I do that um, a certain times of the year. I mix that in my soil uh, because I realize that it kind of helps the plant for the, uh, for the fruit production. When I don't have a lot of fruits, I do use the ultra bloom for the fruit production. And I do try to time it to be um, like later on from uh, fall to winter. So I, do, I don't use the same fertilizer all the time. I see my plant and I see what it may needs and I change it. Um, I do have here, for example, the CalMag and um, that fertilizer, I use it, for example, uh, for plants that shows a little a stress in winter. I have, for example, even though we're not talking about uh, citrus, I do put that um, in, um, in that big orange uh, uh, grapefruit. I put it like, for example, in grapefruits. Um, I see that the grapefruits sometimes get a little bit uh, a frost tender. So I put that CalMac for that. Um, I see I put it for plants that didn't grow too much next year or are dealing with diseases. CalMac is really good for plants that are dealing with diseases. It helps the it helps in the cellular level. So I also the Epsom salt. I am a really big advocate at Epsom salt, and that was something I find out out of me using Epsom salt in my baths and not, uh, trying to recycle the water. And I realized that my plants love Epsom salt and I put it in all of them. Um, the only one I don't put is maples. I have not been able to be strong enough to put it in maples, but rather than that, I do it in citrus. I do it in all my fruit trees. Um, I um, so usually people ask me how to use it. So usually what I do is I take a bath and then I drop the water on them, you know, and I take like maybe once a week a bath uh, with Epsom salts. So I am putting that in the plants. But now that people keep asking me and I have to recommend it and tell them how to use it, 
So I have been recommended for so long. I cannot say for the small trees, like you can use a three quarter of a cup or half of a cup uh, per month and you put it there. And usually I put it in the winter months or early like, or for trees that are kind of like suffering from um, yellowing or not producing fruit, um, I put it in the winter months. If something is getting uh, a little bit of frost tender, so then I put it in the fall months. So like that, they are putting that energy and the, the, they store that magnesium on uh, the root system for winter. So I do use Epsom salt for a lot of plants when I see that they are not, they are growing green, but they are not producing flowers. I use Epsom salt in that too. Uh, fish emulsion is something I use and the kelp, I use it, for example, when I have animals uh, eating the fertilizers. It's really good for that. So I put the fertilizer um, and then, you know, like I can, I can put a little bit of compost and stuff like that. Maybe the dog will try to rub on it, but it will not be able to eat it. The kelp, they don't eat it at all. Um, so... So we have a few of the diseases that we talk about it. Well, I guess we're gonna talk about pests first. So we need to understand that when we are trying to deal with uh, our fruit trees, we are dealing with nature. So we have things that live with us like rats or things that come seasonally and we, we, wanted, we wanted to be able to control them and not necessarily pesticides are good for everything. Or they they can control the disease faster, but they are not necessarily good for the environment or you don't wanna put it because you know your blueberries are already flowering or fruiting and you don't want something. So that is when the mechanical comes to help. So the fall cleaning, the traps, the barriers, the fertilizers and the compost are something that are really good. Um, the pruning, I should, I should put that there. They are really good mechanical things that you could do to control, uh, to control uh, your pests. So this uh, IB organic is something that I have still, since COVID, I have still uh, see a lot of problems with rats. So what rats do is they eat the bark in the trees. So usually they eat the bark in the trees that are really crowded. Um, so they have like a safe little place to go eat and mulch in the cambium. Uh, and what happened is that damage is really dangerous for the tree. The tree cannot callus that damage. It may callus once uh, if they didn't go too far, but if they go and make eat a big piece of the branch, the, the, the wound will be there. So what I, I do is I, I use this bark protection. So usually I am doing my bark protection right in, in fall because I want to be dry when I'm using it. And I go and paint the bark in the inside. And every year for the parts, I have a lot of problems in Mill Valley, Tiburon, Belvedere, like where the water is. I have a lot of problems with rats. Um, so every year with my citrus, in my maples, uh, a, in my apples, I go and put this uh, into the bark. Um, and I think that, you know, like um, if they are able to not find food uh, the, or, or find other food source, they will stop eating this. So uh, the rat control, the bark protection has worked really good. Um, they have different colors, so I kind of like that. Of course, it's going to look like a painted bark, but if it's in the inside, usually people don't see it, but I try to protect it with that. Um, I try to use uh, the golfer baskets or the daffodils for the golfers, for sure. It's something that happens. Uh, last year, it was happening a lot. I don't know if it's just that with all the rain, they multiply or something, or they came back, but... Um, Daffodils are really good for golfer protection. So if you put like a circle of daffodils around your, your trees, so then they don't like the flavor, they don't go through it. Uh, insect prevention, again, you, ha you have some fertilizers, these fertilizers from the happy frog, 
um, helps with the calcium. You can have the magnesium helps uh, also uh, to make that cell wall uh, stronger. Um, you also have like, um, if you have trips and stuff like that, uh, you don't necessarily need to do chemical. You can do the old fashioned apple cider. Um, uh, also, if you have little, um, I had an infestation of these little green worms in my garden and I did mechanical and then I travel and I came back and they were there and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do mechanical. And then I did a spray with, um, apple cider vinegar. You just had to dilute it because you want to burn your plant. But I had the blueberries going, so I didn't want to really spray my blueberries with any chemicals. So I did apple cider and then I washed my blueberries when I picked them up and that was fine. So just have in mind and you can find a lot of sources of uh, like organic products or products that are not harmful for the environment uh, um, that you can use for different inf infestations. Um, th then if we go to chemicals, yes, of course, I do have to use chemicals sometimes. It's, 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 it's in my field. So I try to go with chemicals that are not too strong, like kill it all. It's not my chemical. And I know that some people use it and I respect that, but I try not to. So I try, I have been looking and digging. So my first chemical that I actually use and I have to use it and in winter, I, every time I do my pruning, I'm spraying, is the copper. It's the copper fungicide. And it's, um, it, pro it protects so many things, my trees from so many things. The good thing about using copper fer uh, fungicide is that I put it once and I don't put it, like I have to put it in winter. So I know that there are not many bees going around in winter because in, in, in the trees I'm spraying because there are no flowers. So I usually put it, I, I mean, that those peach leaf full power mildew, black spot, rust, anthracnose, fire blight, um, bacterial leaf spot. So the fire blight, the only thing with the fire blight is a preventive. So every time I do my pruning, I am going to do this uh, copper and fungicide if I see uh, fire blight in my trees or for prevention. That is the only one that I use for prevention. I know it works, um, and it also for the olives, I use it. Uh, it doesn't last too long, so you do have to reapply if it rains. Um, so sometimes what I do with the copper fungicide is I apply before the rains. Um, I apply, I do my pruning for the trees that I know I sick. I do the pruning, and I apply copper fungicide on it. And at the end, when a spring is starting, I go and apply the last spray, and that's it. Um, if I have to use um, insecticides, I um, I am really strong in using insecticides. This one is the garlic insecticides. It, the, all the materials that I had inside, the bush doctor uh, insecticide is, uh, is garlic only in the product. Uh, I do have to say that if you read the bottle, it says that it could be harmful, harmful for the bees. Of course, it's an insecticide. So I will say don't use it if it's a plant that, you know, if it's un, uh, under or in a plant that is uh, with flowers. Um, this is also these mites or insects. Those are also two miticide and fungicide that you can use that they are pretty strong, uh, they work really well, and they do have a lot of uh, materials that are kind of like in the safe side, not so chemical. Um, and in this one is the neem oil. The neem oil is something that like I use in moments that I have a tree that is really dealing with something that is not being able, that I'm not being able to control. But I had done the mechanical, I had done the the soft fertilized uh, the soft uh, chemical products and if I am not being able to control it so then I go with a little bit stronger which will be the neem oil or the horticultural oil or even this um this oh sorry the um um the well I'm forgetting the name of this one uh it's the Captain Jack's the dead bug yeah. 
Yes, that one, the, the bag. <laughs> that one is also like soft in a way, but it does have, the only thing is just you can, when you read the labels, it says 1% of this and then 99% of I don't know. So when they gave me labels like that, I'm already skeptical and I go with uh, this must be a strong fertilizer, a strong uh, product. So um, those are the products that I will say I will use. For any gamases, anything that you see, like a sap, thick sap in your plums, in your apricots, in your stone fruit, which is the one with the big feet, um, those are really, um, um, so it's anthracnose. Those are really, uh, a, they easily get anthracnose on them. So you wanna, every time that you prune, you wanna fertilize, you wanna, a, a, spray with the copper fungicide um, that control cell and you do have to follow the directions so they will say to you how many times you do have to apply this um, I do have to say you want to protect yourself from um, everywhere I did have a goggles that had some sort of um, what a a so they were dark goggles and I spray with the copper and when I, I remove them, I put them again, wherever the copper uh, hit the goggles, now I have these weird dots that no matter how much I wash them, they are damaged pretty much. So it is a, a, a strong a, a chemical a pesticide or fungicide. Uh, so it's not like you don't let it be in your skin uh, protect your eyes, protect everything when you are putting it on. I have seen people just spraying like there is nothing, but it does, it will stain your floors if you have, or your walls, if you are spraying and your tree is right up to it. So what I do is when I spray, I wash right away. I don't let that. I don't wash the tree, but I wash the walls and the floors with it because it's blue. So you will see the blue everywhere. Um, but th that is the only one that actually controls that anthracnose. Uh, and you have to be di diligent. Every time you prune, every time there is an open wound, you want to spray and you want to spray before uh, winter uh, rains. And uh, if you can, in the middle, and if you must, at the end, like right when the spring is coming. And you want to spray everywhere in your tree, every little crack, every little open wound. Um, yeah, so that is it for today. Wow, that was that was a lot of info. That's yeah. awesome. I'm telling you, it's funny because I look down and I'm like, oh my Lord, like it's almost 11, but it doesn't feel like so much time has gone by. I hope that this was as useful for everybody else as it was for, for me and for us. I'm trying to see if there's any last... Um, questions that we can answer. A lot of people are asking about, um, you know, if these, if some of these sprays and fertilizers and whatnot are safe for pets. Um, it says very clearly on all of the packages of products that we sell and anywhere that you're buying them, it will let you know um, whether they're safe to have around pets. Um, and for at slow, we're very specific about not giving absolute advice on pets the same way that like, you know, peanuts and peanut butter is not poisonous, but it is to some people. So it's impossible for us to know whether your pet would have a reaction from one thing or the other. <clears throat> so definitely do your research ahead of time as you're deciding, you know, what products to use and what is safe for your yard, knowing, you know, how your pets interact with your landscaping and, and that kind of thing. So Hopefully that's, I know, kind of generic and general and, and an answer that's not an answer, but the answer is really just to really do your own research. And there is a the website for the SPCA, they have a laundry list of products that, and plants, you know, specifically that are and or aren't or could be harmful or things to pay attention to um, on their website. So just last little questions before we let you guys go. Um, the seal the wrap bark. Um, so you, we were talking a little bit about like how to protect from any kind of, you know, cuts or breaks. And I know I kind of, you know, messed up your flow trying to talk about how to deal with anything that's a wound, but you had talked a little bit about that. Is there anything specific 
for wounds that we didn't get to go over that you think would make sense um, as a product or as a, you know, a process going forward? Um, so usually um, I would say I don't put anything in wounds. Uh, the tree will do itself. Uh, the good thing about pruning when it's dry is that those chemical reaction that the tree does itself um, helps for a uh, things not to come inside the wound. In the long term, if you have a big wound, uh, the big wound is gonna be uh, is gonna take longer to heal. So if you have a wound that is in a spot where water is coming in, um, yes, you can put you can uh, a slow sell it. I don't I don't know if I have it in my uh, in my uh, products right now, but it, you can put a wound protection. It's only for wounds. It's not the right thing. It's right. another totally different. Which what it does is it helps, but you want to put it after you have some sort of donut on your wound. So you will see a little circle coming in. That's right. what we call the donut. So then you want to put that because so that, that, that that's the, the pruning sealant, right? That like you paint it on, it's like a little can. And it's dark, it's dark. Yeah. yeah, I do have it and I do use it for sections. Like I have a maple that had this a burn here. So what I did is I put that seal and I put it right on top of the donut and mm -hmm. all the way around. And what I am trying to protect is wounds, uh, water sitting on it. So I only do that for things that are, too, the wounds are too big, not sealing uh, fast enough. And I want that hard wood to stay hard. So, and I usually put it again, fall. In fall, I'm running around doing all my prep for winter. And that is one of the preps I do. Every tree that I know I have, uh, issues with wounds that were not able to heal because they are the trees are too old to heal that is totally true so then only then i use those for the small young trees small wounds uh, i don't do it 